we have another legend with us professor khurshid mohammad i have great pleasure in introducing him today dr khurshid mohammad is a staff neonatologist at alberta health services calgary zone and a clinical professor of pediatrics at the cummings school of medicine university of calgary to look at his background it's an impressive background dr mohammad graduated in 2006 from university of damascus and arab league with masters degree in pediatrics he went on to complete his neonatal fellowship training at the university of calgary in 2010 uh, neonatal neurology training at the university of columbia and targeted neonatal echocardiography again at the university of columbia and calgary in 2013 in 2014, Dr. Mohammad established the Neonatal Neurocritical Care Program in Calgary in collaboration with the Pediatric Neurology Department. And he is a founding member of the Sonographic Clinical Assessment of Newborn Scan Program. Incidentally, in the conference that we are going to host, uh, hopefully in March, COVID permitting, uh, we are going to have a, one of these uh, session scan workshops in that as well. Friends, for those of you who know Dr. Mohammed, he is a multifaceted personality. His main areas of interest are innovation in education and quality improvement. He is a high tech man. He has established innovation in neonatal neurocritical care education lab, including cranial uh, sonography, phantoms and simulators, neonatal EEG simulator, neonatal neuro logical exam, virtual reality simulators, mannequins, online teaching modules in neonatal neurology and smartphone applications. There are many that he has done in this field and he has, he was one of the leading lights when the pandemic struck for us to depend on for the, how to carry on the uh, uh, knowledge sharing program. Professor Mohammed has organized and led several conferences. He is a great organizer. He has organized various conferences, workshops and courses in neonatal neuro monitoring locally in Canada and all around the world. He is a founding member of Newborn Brain Society, chair of the Society Educational Committee and member of Board of Directors. Dr. Mohammed, uh, uh, he has this uh, passion for quality improvement uh, like most of the people now, his quality improvement work led to significant reduction in mortality and brain injury in extremely premature infants and term infants who suffered from asphyxia and seizures. Dr. Mohammed has received wide recognition as the Canadian Pediatric Society Emerging Leader Award uh, last year in 2020. His areas of research interest are education, brain perfusion, monitoring, and quality improvement, neuroprotection strategies. Today, we are going to have a QA perspective to the topic uh, uh, neuroprotection in preterm infants. Pro Professor Mohammed has published many studies in these areas and holds several research grants. Ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome Dr. Khurshid Mohammed. If I have he, uh, to uh, avoid the technical glitches, he has given the uh, whole video, provided the video which I will be running through. Before that, uh, Dr. Mohammed, do you want to say a few words? Thanks, Dr. Manoj. It's really an honor to be here and I enjoyed my trips to India to several places. I hope the pandemic will end and we will be able to see each other in, in person. And I'm hoping after the presentation, we'll have some discussion about the topic because it is a problem all over the world. And I think that there are simple, innovative ways to prevent the preterm brain injury. It's an honor to be here and I'm really thankful to, for the opportunity. You bet. We are going to have a wide variety of uh, interesting discussion. We have great moderators today, whom I'll be I mean, again introducing after the, after your talk. So the discussion is going to be fantastic. I'm very sure about it. So let's straight away go on to the talk. If there is any technical glitch, kindly uh, inform me since it's a recorded one. Thank you, Dr. Manoj, for the kind introduction and for giving me the opportunity to present today. So I have nothing to disclose other than mentioning that the clinical case I will identify today is with parental permission. My problem today 
is to explain some sorry shall we go ahead some key quality improvement terminology which was gibberish to me when i started this project when, about when, when you share i'll try to do that things. through two clinical cases one was before the implementation of the bundle and one after to show how the practice has changed at individual level and all, also uh, through steps we have taken in planning and implementing our two quality improvement project drive ivh to zero and preterm brain injury classification each took about six years in making i will also occasionally present selective evidence from literature to make certain points finally i will finish up with the short term and some long term outcomes of the drive ivh to zero project implementation so the first case before the implementation born at 23 plus 6 days at birth the mother received one dose of steroid delivered at our level 3 center vaginally intubated at delivery room and the code ph was 7.19 the admission temperature was 36.5 central lines were inserted baby had rds required surfactant at some point failed extubation and had co2 fluctuation with mixed metabolic and respiratory acidosis the other case after the implementation of the bundle was a 27 plus 2 tie dye ivf twin b male with severe ivgr the mother again received one dose of steroids 17 hours before delivery and max olfa one day before the delivery the ultrasound doppler was horrible for fetus one so the discussion with the family was either to deliver immediately and take the risk or allow twin b to pass in utero to improve uh, the outcome for twin a the parents decided to take the risk and deliver so the baby was delivered by emergency c section abgars were 1 6 and 8 Core pH was 6.9, and CPAP was started in the case room. Intubated with reasonable ventilatory settings, except FiO2 was around 49%. The first blood gas was mixed, uh, was mainly metabolic acidosis 7.17, CO2 37, base excess minus 14, lactate of 12.8, and uh, X-ray showed signs of RDA, so surfactant was given. how will the management of these two cases differ with and without the neuroprotection bundle we shall see throughout the presentation the heart of quality improvement project is the problem identification without clear identification definition and standard measurement of a problem smart aim process measures and balancing measures and so on may become waste of effort and time and it may create unnecessary frustration or false reassurance so the first question we ask ourselves which type of preterm brain injury are we targeting the cumulative subtle or white matter injury on the left or the acute early brain injury on the right to ensure feasibility compliance and quick result we decided to go with the acute early brain injury prevention although the title of my talk stated ivh prevention but what we really targeted was early acute brain injury i used ivh because it's the most infamous among all also whenever i mention grade 4 ivh by mistake what i really mean is periventricular hemorrhagic infarct What is the nature or cause of the early acute preterm brain injury for several anatomical and physiological reason it is a vascular injury for example the illustration on the right shows the venous system you can appreciate uh, the bottleneck drainage passing through the germinal matrix if an infant for example develop bad or big grade 1 ivh the venous return make it compromised and end up with periventricular hemorrhagic infarct the picture on the left uh, on the other hand shows the arterial system again you can see the watershed area within the germinal matrix which make it very vulnerable and ischemia 
is the main initial insult followed by reperfusion. As you know, the fetus is exposed to a hypoxic environment and can cope with it due to the abundance of fetal hemoglobin, which has high affinity to oxygen. This allows the red blood cells to hold on to oxygen for longer and break the cycle of hypoxia if, if occurred. Why we care about germinal matrix? Why is it so special? Well, it's the source of neurons and supportive cells. You can see the fascinating time-lapse clip on the uh, right, which shows a neuron migrating along a radial glial cell axon, then get relocated uh, in, her, in its final destination. And then why is the germinal matrix very vulnerable? One of the main reasons is the immaturity of the blood-brain barrier. If you look at the picture on the left, you can see the appreciate the robust and mature blood-brain barrier uh, compared to the picture on the right, which is a courtesy of Dr. Sarnath uh, sent me this slide. You can see the naked vessel exposed completely in a very densely populated area. This is what we are dealing with in a preterm uh, brain, which is frightening, to be honest. I talked about the uniqueness of the anatomy, and here just to show you how the venous system is going through the bottleneck through the germinal matrix, and if you have grade one that compromises and seals the venous drainage, the medullary veins, it can cause grade four or periventricular hemorrhagic infarct. The last two points in the acute early brain injury pathophysiology are the concept of brain autoregulation. In a nutshell, preterm uh, infant autoregulation is almost flat or pressure passive, meaning the lower the blood pressure, the lower perfusion to the brain, and vice versa. Unlike uh, uh, term units, adults, and children, where you have this safe window, the, where the fluctuation in the blood pressure does not reflect on the changes uh, as changes in the brain perfusion. Sorry, and the last, the second point is that these babies, they are born prone to ischemia. This was a study we did here in Calgary looking at the numbers of APCs, which is epithelial progenerator cells in the cord blood in babies born less than 30 weeks gestational age. And what we found that the ones who ended up developing IBH, they had significantly lower APCs, which are the building blocks for vessels. And there was a dose effect. So the higher the grade of IBH, the lower the counts of APCs. So this means they are already at risk of ischemia even before any of our intervention. So in summary, the germinal matrix is like a highway under construction where we will be double fined if we don't slow down. Not only we don't slow down, we light speed through, through it with our investigations and interventions. The next step in the quality improvement project planning is not number one, the smart end but rather number four, the um, outcome measures. And that is because it's closely linked to problem identification. If we use the wrong yardstick, we will misinterpret the results just like this cartoon where he still finds traces of mercury in the fish using a mercury thermostat. So what is the best tool to measure our outcome of interest? Luckily, we don't have a long list to choose from. It's either MRI or ultrasound. The advantages of ultrasound is being accessible, mobile, and easy to use as compared to MRI, which is more accurate and specific and has better uh, prediction value. However, for any tool to be used at a large scale successfully, it must meet these criteria. It must be easy to be used and apply at different settings. Of course, image-based, easily communicated, evidence-based, and applicable worldwide. And considering all these items, cranial ultrasound wins by large margin over MRI. So, so far, we decided on our problem we wanted to target, which is early acute brain injury. We identified our tool, which is cranial ultrasound. Now we need to move to definition of preterm brain injury using ultrasound. And the first question we asked, is there a variability in preterm brain injury diagnosis and severity using cranial ultrasound? Locally, we reviewed about 417 abnormal studies by three observers to assess inter-observer reliability. In this table, we compared the reports 
to the neuroradiologist independent reading. There was very poor correlation between the report assessment and the independent reading. Furthermore, there was a significant variability within the report itself for the same patient. At the national level, we took a variety of abnormal cases, then asked radiologists and neonatologists across Canada to grade them. This is one example of a case that we sent around on the left, and the variability of the diagnosis on the right. The variability was present in all cases that we have sent. The graph on the left is showing a study uh, out of the Canadian Unital Network was published around 2000, I think, or 2002, and showed the quite variability in the incidence or diagnosis of preterm brain injury. And this was the case even after adjustment of all kind of confounding factors. Interestingly, only when they adjusted for the use of inotropes and uh, uh, metabolic acidosis treatment, the variability disappeared, which will turn to be important years uh, ahead, and I will explain that later. On the right, you see a study in a different country participating in the iNeo network, and again shows the same theme, the incidence of preterm brain injury using ultrasound varies from country to country. So the bottom line is variability is in making the diagnosis is a reality, which is a big problem. Without addressing it first, we cannot move to intervention and implementation. So the question we ask ourselves, what are some sources of variability in the diagnosis of brain injury using ultrasound? We identify six sources of variability to address. The first was about the timing of ultrasound, when to perform the first cranial ultrasound, now how frequent to repeat the scan in normal and different abnormal scenarios. So we came up with the task force with an algorithm uh, for uh, algorithms for all those kind of scenarios. So the, the second source of variability is making the diagnosis based on one plane only without confirming it with the other cats. So this is an example of a preterm baby, twin, 25 weaker, very sick, ventilated, large PDA, only one dose of, of steroids. And this was the first ultrasound at about day four of life, which showed this big clot on the right. And this was reported as grade four IVH. We approached the family at some point and uh, talked to them about palliative care. But when we really looked at the, uh, the sagittal, you can see the clot is outside the parenchyma and it's sitting in the chordothalamic nodes. There is some blood layering in the occipital horn as well. So this was probably grade two IVH. And thank God we didn't withdraw care from this girl. And she's doing fantastic now at five years of age. The other variability source is echogenicity. How much brightness is too much? And what is bright for me might not be for you and vice versa. So what we decided to do is use the choroid plexus brightness as reference. If a bright area is brighter than the choroid plexus, we will call it significant. If it's less bright than the choroid plexus, then we'll follow it up. This was an example of late preterm baby presented with seizure was sick, we couldn't send the baby to MRI, then we performed an ultrasound. So they identified this area of brightness, which was reported as an intraparenchymal hemorrhage. And then later on, the baby becomes stable. We send uh, it to MRI. This is T2-weighted MHCSF is white. And the same area did not show hemorrhage. It was, in fact, edema, not hemorrhage. The hemorrhage is black on T2-weighted image. Once we agree on the brightness cutoff, then when do we call it hemorrhage versus ischemia? So to create consistency, what we decided is to step back and ask the first question, is there a germinal matrix hemorrhage? If there is a germinal matrix hemorrhage, like the case on the right, and intraparenchymal significant echogenicity, then we will call it periventricular hemorrhagic infarct. If there is no germinal matrix hemorrhage, like this case, and there is a significant echogenicity, then we will call it significant ischemia. And then the, the other big question, when do we call an IVH grade 3 uh, or post-hemorrhagic ventricular dilatation? Many of our cases were initially graded as grade 2, and then later on when they developed post-hemorrhagic ventricular dilatation, the grading was changed and upgraded to grade 3 IVH, when in fact was a complication of the grade 2 IVH. So what we decided to do, again, to create consistency, is to use the first week worse ultrasound 
grading as the final grading and we will not change the grading after that unless it's completely new meaning if you have grade two it stays grade two and if this, that baby developed post hemorrhagic ventricular dilatation it will be secondary to grade two not a new grade three and the other thing about grade three the question will come is it 50 percent of the normal sized ventricle or 50 percent from dilated ventricles so if you solve that problem we said we need to have two criteria for the grade three. The blood has to fill more than 50% of the ventricle and the blood itself had to distend the ventricle. So this is the classic one there. The finally is the classic cystic PVL versus porencephalic cyst. Porencephalic cyst really is a secondary uh, to the periventricular hemorrhagic infarct where the blood is resolved and the area get chewed by macrophages and leave this big single uh, cysts that eventually merge and connect with the anterior horn of the lateral ventricle as compared to the periventricular locomalacia where you have multiple cysts of multiple sizes at different level around the ventricles. So locally we use those 417 abnormal cases in addressing those sources of variability. This has been led by my colleague Dr. Uh, Laura Leiger and Dr. James Scott, our neuroradiologist. The first paper came out, we were looking at the ventricular megary measurement, which index is the best and more, most practical to use. And we found that anterior horn width was the most practical and re reliable index uh, to be used. At a bigger scale, we put together a task force of radiologists and neonatologists across the country. We put together a library of abnormal studies representing sources of variation examples, then loaded them into a simulators created locally. We conducted two face-to-face -face workshops, needless to say, that was before the COVID-19 pandemic. During the workshop, we had a didactic lectures, small groups, discussion, polling, and surveys. So the final product of this effort was a consensus statement which has been submitted for publication to standardize time and definitions of preterm brain injury using cranial ultrasonography. The uptake was great. The rate of ventricular index and anterior horn widths reporting, for example, were significantly higher after the consensus statement implementation across Canada. And then the final step was to put it into a smartphone application. So we took that classification, we put it into a smartphone application and we made it available for everybody for free. So basically when you click on make the diagnosis, it will ask you subsequent uh, questions and based on your question, it will move you one way or another. And along the line, there will be pop-up images explaining the definitions. And if you have a question about the definition, you can click here and it will show the atlas of the definition that we have used. This is the lake of Maureen, two hours from my house. And you can see I spent lots of time talking about the problem uh, identification, definition, and outcome measures. Because without that, all the effort will be in vain. Now, are we at the first step yet? Not quite. We need to figure out our own risk factor, which will set our own priority. This will differ from one center to another. And although there are common themes and principles, there is no one size fits all. The good news is just by auditing and studying risk factor prospectively in a systematic way, you can decrease the incidence of IVH. And this was shown in this study from Germany by Dr. Hamler and his group that just by doing that, they were able to decrease the incidence of IVH. This is due to the fact that we all slow down when we realize somebody is watching. Like when you drive past a cup, it's just a human nature. For us, we grouped risk factor and teams and broken them down into modifiable factors in preparation for developing our uh, intervention. At this stage, we were ready to put our SMART aim. SMART stands for, it's an acronym, S for specific. So our specific goal was to reduce death and or severe brain injury by 50%. Is this question specific enough? No. What do you mean by severe brain injury? So we, have a, we had a specific definition about uh, the severe brain injury. Uh, and then 50% of what? So 50% of our own baseline, which was 12%, by when? And then we said in one year we need to make this uh, reduction. And from when? When is the starting time? It's very important to have very clear starting date because it builds motivation and anticipation. And everybody's waiting and that will increase your compliance. And then 
M stands for measurable. So the, the, whatever outcome you're looking at, you have to be able to measure it. So that was the half of the presentation I was talking about. And then A it talks about applicable. So can you apply and implement this? Uh, is it feasible? So what we did, we consulted stakeholders, working group leaders, and involved them early on, and of course, frontline workers. R stands for realistic. So there has to be balance be between being ambitious and realistic. Because if you are ambitious, you create this challenge and, and motivation that we have to do this. Now we are challenged. So we decide to be a little bit ambitious. We said we want to decrease the incidence by 50% in, in a year, and of course, the skepticism was all over the place, and uh, it it gave us more motivation and challenge to do this. And lastly, time is, is a key is for timely. So there was a local interest because our baseline in the incidence was high, and there was higher level support, and there was a national initiative at the time called Drive IVH to Zero, which we have joined. So that's the smart uh, aim. Key elements in our driver diagram. So you need to draw your driver di diagram. They, they were focusing on the outborn infant, handling in the first 72 hours, hemodynamic management, respiratory management. It's always a good idea to remember the 80-20 rule when assessing any intervention. 80% of outcomes comes from 20% of interventions. So you prioritize those interventions. We then spread the risk factors over time to identify windows of intervention. So we had prenatal, transportation, birth, critical window in the first 72 hours. Based on those windows, we developed neuroprotection intervention or packages, which I will explain one by one. This is the beautiful town of Banff, one hour and 20 minutes from my house, so we are getting closer. Let's dive into some key intervention of the bundle. First, we had to come up with windows of intervention. The window had to be as short as possible to avoid fatigue, yet it had to be long enough for our interventions and to make the desired impact. We came up with a 72 hours critical window given the fact that the vast majority of the early acute brain injury occurs in the first 72 hours, as well as most intervention and many complications. We put up signs of sleeping brain and clock to remind bedside staff about the critical window and show them correct midline position, which was one of the intervention. Now, I want to take a moment here to acknowledge and thank nurses and RTs. If you want your bundle to be successful, then involve and engage nurses. Without them, with them, you are in business. Without them, it will be very challenging to implement a bundle successfully. This was shown by Dr. Myler and her group from Netherlands is by just doing that, having a neuroprotection bundle led by nurses, they were able to reduce the incidence of significant brain injury. One challenge remained, though, is how can we quantify handling in the first 72 hours? This issue goes under process management, and that's a terminology in quite improvement. One idea is to use a pedometer attached to the door of the incubator to measure opening and closing as steps. We can then use that as a surrogate marker for handling. Maternal interventions are rather simple. We advocated for a neutral transfer. Many cases that end up delivered outside the tertiary center could probably have been transferred in neutral. The Australian experience is a good example. We encourage the use of antenatal steroids and magnesium sulfate. And then for transportation, we developed a neuroprotection bundle on transport, which was incorporated in our outreach program led by my colleague, Dr. Thomas. Then uh, these were included, uh, the, the, the outreach um, uh, program were like in-person visits uh, to all our referring center to deliver didactic sessions, simulation and case discussion sessions, followed by telemedicine. And the implementation of neuroprotection bundle on transportation, which included decreased vibration, noise, and handling on transportation. The golden hour approach. This part is led by my colleague, Dr. Abu Muharram, and the golden hour team. This beautiful graph are courtesy of Danny Smith, our uh, clinical project manager and co-chair of the Neonatal Quality Improvement Committee. 
they show a stepwise approach to thermal regulation to maintain the temperature, respiratory support through early CPAP and maintaining the functional residual capacity and early caffeine, and then followed by timely vascular access. Our practice has been in tiny babies to insert a PIV and start dextrose while inserting central line to avoid hypoglycemia, and then early TPN and nutrition and minimal handling. You can see the action on the left as the countdown approaches the 60 minute. Inotropes. For years, we thought the low blood pressure is the culprit in terms of causing brain injury. Uh, that, was, that was my main hypothesis when I did my neonatal neurology fellowship with Dr. Miller in Vancouver. However, for the life of me, I couldn't find a relationship between the blood pressure number and brain injury, whether on MRI or ultrasound. There was, however, a consistent finding showing up over and over until it caught my attention. It was the treatment that associated with significant brain injury, not the hypotension itself. Suddenly, a bulb led above my head and everything started to make sense. During the reperfusion phase, when the brain autoregulation is gone and the perfusion is pressure passive, giving inotropes might be harmful. That's exactly what we showed in this study, looking at close to 500 extremely premature infants. And no matter what we adjusted for, the, the use of inotropes, early use of inotropes associated with all kinds of uh, brain injury and composite outcomes. So based on this work, we developed a protocol for hemodynamic management, which takes into consideration clinical and imaging and lab markers after ruling out uh, iatrogenic causes of hypotension. So going back to our cases, in case one, before the implementation of the bundle, this baby developed low MEBP and required two boluses of normal saline and dopamine infusion. In case two, after the implementation, the baby also developed low mean BP, but no treatment was given as the baby was clinically stable. We started advocating for delayed cord clamping as well, and this was led by uh, our nurse practitioner, Lee Arvine. In an oversimplified way, when a baby breathes, the pulmonary vascular bed opens. And if the cord is connected, it will take blood from the cord and the placenta because they have low pressure. If the cord is cut immediately, then the, the vascular bed will take blood from other organs through the PDA, which will cause ischemia followed by reperfusion. I must say I'm very nervous about cord milking as it can change hemodynamics very abruptly and may cause harm. And the most recent RCD showed just that. It is fascinating that immediate cord clamping was based on no evidence and the assumption that the cord is dirty, and yet it took us many RCTs to prove what is common sense in nature. I wanted to show you this short video of uh, Orangutan giving birth. Observe how she performs NRP initial steps on an intact cord and see the joy and satisfaction on their faces at the end. Here it comes, here it comes. This is it, that's the head. That's it, it's out. It's out. That's it. She's starting to remove the amniotic sac. Oh, there we go. Yes. Wow, she's just cleared the baby's airways. He's reacting to his daughter's birth. First sounds. The look on their faces is priceless. Implementing all that resulted in a significant reduction in our use of inotropes and normal saline boluses. It's now a history in our unit in the first 70 hours. We rarely use them. Here comes another terminology in QI, balancing measures. Whenever we introduce a new intervention, we need to make sure it's not causing harm. In the case of permissive hypotension, if you like, we we wanted to make sure the rate of cystic and non-cystic white matter injury did not increase after the intervention, which wasn't the case uh, in, uh, in our unit. On the contrary, the rate of death and or severe brain injury followed the same trend as the reduction in the inotropes use. PDA is a big dilemma that I don't think I can solve here. It's complex, multifactorial, and moving target by seconds. 
However, there are two extremes when it comes to PDA management. Pure clinically oriented management, the problem with this approach is there is a silent window before the effect of PDA shows clinically about 24 to 48 hours based on Dr. Evans' work. And sometimes we miss the boat by then. The other extreme is echo directed treatment. The problem with this approach is that we may end up over treating and cause some iatrogenic diagnosis. You can change the measurements and the flow by changing the probe position. Having said that, what we found when we looked at our data is that. If the bedside physician decided using a collective markers, clinical and echo, that the PDA is significant, treating that PDA early with endo may decrease the incidence of death and or severe brain injury. This brings us uh, to the question of prophylactic versus, prophylactic versus targeted endometacine, which is falling out of favor, I would say, due to the risk of spontaneous intestinal perforation and PPHN exaggeration. This is a nice study led by our colleagues in Edmonton, where we looked at the use of prophylactic endometacine at different gestational ages and risk of SIP or brain injury in the Canadian Unital Network Participating Center. Interestingly, we found a threshold of 26-week gestation. Below that, the risk of SIP and severe brain injury decreased. Beyond that gestational age, the risk of SIP increased without a significant gain in brain injury reduction. What about PPHN? We used to give a second dose of surfactant as a knee-jerk reaction whenever the FIA2 increases beyond certain threshold after the first dose of surfactant. That practice may have caused significant deterioration in some infant with pure PPHN after the first dose of surfactant. Then the pendulum swung to the other end and we started to do more bedside functional echocardiography and treat with more uh, the, more frequently with INO, which wasn't without risk uh, either. Think about it. Uh, this way. A baby with a full-blown RTS, PDA is open and bidirectional. We gave the first dose of surfactant. The lung compliance improved immediately and the shunt through the PDA either become abruptly left-right causing ischemia or it unveiled a, a pure PPHN. This paper led by one of my colleagues, Dr. Streska, showed that there was no difference between early and late uh, surfactant and administration. However, in this paper, there were babies who received surfactant. They, they was associated with significant higher composite of death and severe brain injury. Now, of course, these babies were sicker, they were younger, but they have adjusted for all this kind of uh, confounding factor, and this was still persistent. This is in no way uh, a, a recommendation against surfactant. Surfactant is a lifesaver, and we need to give it when, uh, when it's indicated. It's just to illustrate the complexity of the physiology in the first 72 hours of life. What I do personally in a ventilated extreme premature infant with full-blown RTS who receives surfactant, I check the PDA after the first 24 hours of life and within the critical window before extubation. If the PDA is mostly left to right, like the example here, you can see the flashing blue and red through the PDA, it means it's bidirectional, which was confirmed through uh, the Doppler. Above the baseline is moving toward the probe and below the baseline is moving away the probe. So this is left to right and this is uh, right to left. So this PDA was mostly left to right. So at this stage, and if there is no IVH on the cranial ultrasound, I treat it with uh, endometacine. So in case one, before the implementation of the bundle, the baby did have bidirectional PDA in the first 72 hours, which wasn't treated, and baby had PPHN on echo, but no INO was given. In case two, after the implementation of the bundle, the PDA was treated at 30 hours of life because it was mostly left to right, and baby didn't have IVH. And uh, I do a targeted treatment, so I repeat the echo before the next dose, so the baby end up uh, receiving only two doses of endometacin at the full course. Moving to respiratory management, our first step at this aim to decrease the hypercapnia 
and extubation failure. Therefore, we advocated to keep all infants below 26 weeks gestational age intubated for the first 72 hours till we develop our intubation and extubation protocol. We then studied the impact of hyper and hypocapnia on brain injury. To our surprise, metabolic acidosis was the most important factor more than hyper and hypocapnia. This work done by one of our ex-NNCC fellow, Dr. Goswami, who is now a neonatologist uh, at McMaster University. So the worst combination in terms of having severe brain injury was mixed respiratory and metabolic acidosis. And going back to physiology, it made total sense as CO2 doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier. It has to be converted to hydrogen ion. That's why acidosis is more harmful and worse with hypercapnia. Back to balancing measure. Are we causing harm by keeping this in? infant intubated to avoid variability and create inconsistency. So this CIHR grant we got to, in attempt to answer some of those questions related to ventilation and brain injury. These are some of the questions we will address. Right now we are trying to address the last one in a comparative effectiveness trial. So in case one, before the implementation, the baby remained intubated, not intentionally, just because the baby was 23 weeks gestational age and we couldn't extubate within the critical window. But case two remained intubated intentionally as per the protocol for the first 72 hours of life. Now, we took the principle of the bundle and put together a position statement with the Canadian Pediatric Society in an attempt to, to expand the footprint of the implementation of the bundle across the country. This is the Kananaskas country, 15 minutes from my house, so we are almost there. I think of QI as the art of research. That's why you need more than literature review and evidence base to be successful. These are some books I have read at the beginning of the project to help me navigate the complex system and problem. The other thing I will advise outside the traditional evidence-based research is to find a way to make it personal, to keep you motivated, to feel the drive to zero every day. So for me, I personalized my uh, car license plate. In Alberta, we are limited to seven characters, so I had to be creative. So we read it, drive, IVH, to zero. So every day when I hop to my car or register its plate into a parking lot pay machine, I remember the Drive to Zero project. We are at the end of our journey. This is the picture, a picture of the beautiful city of Calgary at night with the Peace Bridge. The one million question, one million dollar question remains. Was it worth it? What is the impact at the bedside level, anecdotal? What is the impact locally, short term and long term and nationally? So back to the case, this was the case before the implementation, the 23-weeker, she had a classic grade 4 IVH or periventricular hemorrhagic infarct. And case 2, before our classification, we would have called this as grade 3 IVH, but after our classification, the blood wasn't distending the ventricles, so we called it grade 2 IVH, and then eventually that clot shrunk without causing any ventricular dilatation and the, the, the brain parenchyma was fine. So this is the result, the short-term outcome result of the implementation of the bundle it was published in Pediatric Neurology. We looked at 301 extreme premature infant before the implementation and 364 babies after the implementation of the bundle. And you can see the care was changed remarkably. The inotropes used was significantly lower. The normal ceiling boluses were significantly less. Delayed core clamping was increased. Hemothorax was lower. And the, the pleasant surprise was the use of sedation and opioid. Because we implemented the minim minimal handling and the perception that the babies are not being handled well, whether that, uh, much whether that's uh, right or wrong, it led to reduction in the use of sedation and opioid. And if you listen to um, Sandra Jules' talks and uh, uh, Dr. McPherson and Dr. Miller, you would know the impact of sedation and opioid on the brain development. So that was really nice to see that the use of opioid significantly reduced after the implementation. And then we adjusted for all kind of confounding factors. We did it with or without the washout period. We did interrupt the, the time series analysis, you name it. And still, the implementation of the bundle decreased 
the, the incidence of mortality and the composite outcome by more than 50%. And you can see here was the implementation and then there was a sharp reduction. Not only it decreased the incidence, it decreased the variability. So that means there was more consistency in the care. And compared to the country, we are not supposed to disclose our, uh, disclose our code. These are funnel plots. This is the odd ratio. One is like equal, and then above the baseline is bad, below it is good, and these are the confidence intervals lines. We used to be in the middle of the pack, and then after the implementation of the bundle, we were like one of the the lowest in the country and we were able to maintain that uh, over three years and now for the first time I will present the long-term outcome now I have to disclose this is the very first look it's a simple comparison between the groups before and after we haven't done any adjustment yet we haven't looked at it with the washout period but I thought I'll show you that it did decrease the mortality uh, significantly and if you read some of the papers sometimes 80 percent of the mortality in the extreme pre premature infant is related to brain injury it reduced cerebral palsy by more than 50 percent it reduced the cognitive delay it did reduce any severe disability and it reduced the composite of death and or severe disability significantly now, is it all rosy and shiny? No, we have to keep our eyes on the ball. Otherwise, culture will eat strategy for breakfast without giving us much time to think. And that's what happened with us when we let our guards down for a moment and then our rates start to bounce back. And currently, we are revamping the bundle implementation. But that's okay, just like this car trying to get out of the parking lot and hit a roadblock. We can always back up and and find another path. I wanted to leave you with two thoughts through the first case actually before the implementation of our bundle and ended up with grade 4 IVH and this poor encephalic cyst here. Just to make two points. One, that brain injury is not a death sentence and there is no correlation between the amount of love that a kid can give and their uh, its severity of the brain injury. So when I asked Harper mom, Yulia, uh, for her permission to present about her case in this forum, not only she uh, gave, uh, uh, agreed, she gave me a most recent uh, video of her daughter, which I wanted to show you. Yeah, ma, I, you are my sunshine, my only sunshine, you make me happy. You'll never know dear, how much I love you. Please don't take my sunshine away. <laughs> Thank you. Now, now, now. You are my sunshine, my only sunshine. You make me happy when skies are gray. You'll never know, dear, how much I love you. Please don't take my sunshine away. The other night, dear, as I lay sleeping, I dreamed I held you in my arms. When I awoke, dear, I was mistaken, so I hung my head and cried. You are my sunshine, my only sunshine. You make me happy when skies are gray. You'll never know, dear, how much I love you. Please don't take my sunshine away. Hope is one thing. We, we need to make sure we are not taking it away from the parents because what happens is we develop something called label-locked minds. So label-locked minds, we label a baby or a patient with, or the person or something, and then whatever happened, we attribute it to that label. And then we stop investing in our kid and we go into this vicious cycle. So uncertainty is not always bad. It, 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 it opens the horizon for opportunities and investment in our kids. And time after time, we see that the, the main and key factor in improving the outcome is the parental in, in, involvement in their kids. 
So with that, I want to thank uh, the, my colleagues, uh, institutions, programs, uh, funding agencies, and above all, I would thank the, the families and the patients. It is a privilege to take care of them. Wow, that was an excellent journey we just had. An awesome journey uh, that we were identifying with you by, by, by the time you reach home. Uh, we are so contented. Uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, before we go on to, we have an excellent uh, uh, discussion coming up. Before we go on to that, let me just uh, tell you what is in store for you in the grand final of this series. That is our conference. Well, friends, now we have an excellent uh, discussion coming up and we are fortunate to have one of the true legends of neontology from, uh, from India, Professor Saurabh Datta as the uh, first moderator for the session. And uh, along with him, we have uh, Dr. Sandil Kumar, consult consultant neonatologist from uh, Trichy, Southern India. So welcome to both of you, sirs, uh, the Professor Saurabh Datta and Dr. Sindhil Kumar. Now may I request you to kindly take over the session and uh, uh, may, may I request uh, uh, all of you to kindly uh, write your, type your questions in the Q&A box, not in the chat box. It makes it easier for the moderators to respond to them. Actually ask the questions to the uh, Professor Koshit. Over to you, Professor Saurabh Datta. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Manoj. And uh, Dr. Koshid Mohammed was an absolutely fantastic lecture. Enjoyed every bit of it. And uh, you know your uh, passion, which you know, just came through, uh, reflected in even the number plate of your car, and uh, you know that wonderful video that he showed at the end. Um, so 
uh, I I really like the way you you know talked about the second dose of surfactant and uh, you know the use of the second dose gradually going down. That we should avoid the use of inotropes, how it actually worsens the outcome. And I found it interesting that you give a dose of indomethacin for PDA after the first dose of surfactant. And maybe you can have some discussion on that because I don't know how prevalent that practice is. And your emphasis on the fact that uh, metabolic acidosis is actually a bigger culprit than uh, you know uh, than CO two. So a lot of very interesting uh, you know points for discussion. And uh, very rightly you highlighted that you need a care bundle to drive down. You know an individual strategy working in isolation is not going to do the job if you're if you're really going to attempt uh, in an ambitious program like trying to drive IVH down to zero. So uh, with that, I'll take up some questions which are in the Q&A box. I will also take questions which are in the chat box because I know a lot of people by you know instinctively post their questions in the chat box. So let's start off with the Q&A uh, box. So the first question is from Dr. Livert Mamami Flores. Uh, the question is, what do you think of uh, intranasal colostrum? to reduce the degree of intracranial hemorrhage. I've personally never heard of that association, but uh, could you address that question? And yeah, there is absolutely. another question, which is what do you think about erythropoietin? Yeah. Absolutely. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear yeah. you very well. I think one point I want to make uh, at front, if you don't mind, uh, is if you notice, most of the interventions are cheap and simple. And as a human being, we always look for a magic bullet that you can give and then go and have a rest. And as they say, there are no shortcuts to heaven. There is no way around uh, sweating, having sleepless nights, and working as a group uh, to create consistency to prevent IVH because it's a complex issue. It's like if you if your smartphone is broken, it's not working, you want to fix it with a hammer. There's no way you fix a smartphone with a hammer. So you have to take it to the professional, you have to spend time, you have, we have to work together to prevent this complex uh, issue. So it, when I address the questions of uh, endometacin, uh, APO, or clostrum, those are not magic bullets unless we work as a team and develop a bundle and implement it consistently, we will not be able to make the difference. So back to the question of the cholesterol, I think the, the first time I heard about it was uh, in HIE, when they were talking about giving the, the stem cells to patients, uh, children with cerebral palsy. And this was the, the studies out of Duke University, and they showed that the degree of the cerebral palsy was milder with uh, the stem cells. So it comes back to the stem cells idea and theory that cholesterol and fresh breast milk has lots of stem cells. And if you give it intranasally, then the stem cells will migrate to the brain and, and prepare the injury. Uh, it is promising. There's one RCT that showed that if you give it to babies with injury, because the IVH happens in the first 72 hours. So there is no way you can prevent that with the intranasal cholesterol, but you can decrease the degree of injury. And so in that study, they showed that the size of ventricles were smaller in babies who receive intranasal cholesterol and the size of horn phalluxes was smaller in those babies. And there is an, an RCT that will be going uh, started in Canada, looking at larger numbers, implementing the intranasal cholesterol. And for that also, we started fresh uh, breast milk in babies with HIE during cooling, following the same idea that these babies may get some stem cells through their mom's own milk if we feed them trophic amount during the cooling. The second question is APO. I think APO, if you can give it very, very early during the ischemic phase, then it might work. If you give it during the reperfusion phase, it may be harmful because APO initially will branch out your, your vessels and improve the perfusion. And if the baby is going through the reperfusion and abundant of, of uh, blood going to the brain, then you may cause harm. And that there, there is talk now about trying to give APO 
very early when the baby is, is going through the ischemic phase. Yeah, the next question is by Dr. Jagjit Teji. Uh, he asks, has artificial intelligence been applied to these predictors and outcomes? Uh, the, I think uh, it depends what you mean by artificial intelligence. Uh, it's um, probably machine learning tools yeah. to try and predict outcomes yeah, so, based so, on a large yeah, data sets uh, and so on. It's a short, short answer is yes, they have uh, uh, this calculator, if, if you remember, where you punch in uh, five risk factors and gives you the, the percentage of risk that this baby will have for severe IVH. And that's the NICHP uh, calculator that we all know. They took all the data and they created uh, this calculator to modeling. The other is the work that Lina Shalak did with combining the EEG and NIRS reading, and they created this heat map using this artificial intelligence and, and machine learning. And that's more in HIE, and I think that will come to um, the preterm babies as well. The challenges, I have been trying to work on this for years now, is to take the data from different monitors, because they are made by different uh, companies. They don't talk to each other. So you have to create this interface or box to feed in all the, the, the parameters and then spill it out in time-locked manner. And then the third layer is to have a program who can deal with all of that. So MATLAB is, is the most famous program that deal with that. You have to have your number of near infrared spectroscopy, the regional saturation. And at the same time point, what was your blood pressure and what was the, the, the oxygen saturation and the CO2? And then the machine can look at the coherence because really if you if the coherence is high, it means there is strong correlation between the fluctuation in the blood pressure and the fluctuation in the regional saturation. That means that the autoregulation is gone. And if the coherence is low, then the, the autoregulation is intact. Now people were able to do it in the research setup. It's not easy enough yet to implement it at the bedside. That I would say it, it didn't become uh, feasible for clinical care. Thank you. Uh, the next question is by Dr. Bashir Ahmad. He asks, uh, it's a very important question. What is the importance and impact of the overall high standard of care available in centers like yours on the final outcome, in addition to the specific components of the neuroprotection intervention? I think it might be, uh, but I would say that what we tried with the bundle is to decrease the need for the high income uh, materials and tools. So if you look at the components of the bundle, it's really all about the people and what we do with them. And I mean, the countries like India, you guys have produced three vaccines in very short time. So it is possible. That's where the innovation comes in place. If you have the right will and the right desire, you can create the environment that protect these babies. And if, if you think about one intervention to in, in the, the resource limited country is the decrease of risk of um, hypothermia. If you can decrease the risk of hypothermia on admission, then many of those complications will go away. The other simple intervention is delayed core clamping. You can do delayed core, primates can do delayed core clamping. So you can do delayed core clamping wherever you are. The third is uh, the, the incubator. You have incubator there, resuscitation. You can do resuscitation. You can do the golden hour. So all those interventions are feasible. It just needs time and effort. It, it can't be uh, from behind the desk. desk. You, we have to all uh, pull up our sleeves and be involved in this, but it is possible. It's not only in the high income countries. Yeah. Uh, the next question is by Dr. Ayman Sakkar. Do you use or recommend using prophylactic hydrocortisone? And is there an effect of that on acute brain injury? I think we had this debate about the, the hydrocortisone. The problem, we, we decided not to use it. That's a short answer. The, the reason why we decided not to is the minute you give hydrocortisone, endometrial become out of the equation because of the risk of spontaneous bowel perforation becomes so significant that nobody will use prophylactic endometacin after giving hydrocortisone. And the other reason why we didn't need to, to uh, initiate the hydrocortisone is because our use of inotropes has decreased already. So we didn't need to have an intervention 
to prevent a problem that doesn't exist. And that goes to the concept of external and internal validity. So when, in, in places where you have high incidence of um, uh, candidemia, then you, you need to use a, a prophylactic uh, antifungal medication. But in places when there is no high uh, candidemia, then there is no point of using it. So that's where in our center, the other reason was our use of inotropes was already low after the intervention. We didn't need to uh, initiate the prophylactic uh, hydrocortisone plus uh, the potential use of a prophylactic engine. Yeah, so this goes with your philosophy of not you know, chasing the blood pressure uh, numbers in the first uh, few hours of life. Uh, so both inotropes as well as hydrocortisone, I think, uh, you know, move out of the window in that case. The next question by Dr. Ayman Sakar is, uh, what is the safest mode of uh, invasive mechanical ventilation from a brain injury, injury perspective, if you do have to give in invasive ventilation? I think the... It, the, the evidence, if you put them together, is the volume guarantee. Volume guarantee is the most physiologic mode of ventilation in extreme preterm babies because the compliance automatically changes and uh, the, um, sorry, the, the pressures automatically changes as the compliance of the lung changes after you give surfactant. Before we used to use the pressure control and we had our respiratory therapist or the neonatologist at the bedside dialing down the pressure after giving surfactant. But going back to the machine learning point, there is no way you can keep up with the compliance because the compliance changes by second and your hand, you are just watching the monitor and dialing down the, you might overdo it or underdo it. Where when it's machine, the machine talks with the, with the lung mechanics and, and changes the pressure immediately based on the compliance. So I would say that the volume guarantee is the one that makes most sense for me, but you may want to go early exit to high frequency if you are having to increase the, the settings in, in those babies rather than escalating your settings and ending, ending up with the iatrogenic complication like pneumothorax or increasing the, the pressure, uh, intracranial pressure and causing migration. So, so do you use SIMV with volume guarantee? Is that what you're talking about? SIMV yeah, yeah, volume guarantee that's, that's as a starting as a starting mode of ventilation. Okay. Uh, question by Dr. Maria Rodriguez Perez: What is your opinion about convectional heat versus irradiation heat in the delivery room for premature infants? I, I saw that question. I don't have experience one way or another. Uh, unfortunately, we use uh, uh, whatever is available in in the unit. We use the, the warmer. Uh, over overhead warmer in the delivery room, and we use the plastic bags to keep keep the baby humid. So the bottom line is, if you can keep the baby's temperature stable, and if you can keep them uh, hydrated and prevent insensible water loss and whatever method or tool you are you are doing and comfortable with, then I, I would say continue with that. So I think most people would use radiant warmers because of the number of interventions you need to do very quickly in the first few minutes of life. I guess it would be difficult if you had a convectional system. Uh, the next question by Dr. Megha Goel, any role of low-dose dexamethasone for the prevention of PPD? And she's referring to the Premilog study. Uh, I, I, we don't use that. So I, I don't know. I mean, I would refer to people who are expert in the respiratory. Uh, but uh, we don't use it for uh, brain injury prevention as such. Okay, uh, there are a set of related questions by Dr. Kumar Gaurav. One is uh, long-term neurodevelopmental de outcomes of babies with IVH. I mean, I think he's referring to your center and specifically the role of platelet transfusions in IVH and PDA and uh, the role of prophylactic endomethacin. If you could take up these three questions. Yeah. Uh... The first question, the long-term outcome, I can tell you um, that we, we showed the difference and we uh, have submitted the paper for publication. I showed some of the results before the publication. The rate of cerebral palsy was reduced by more than 50% and the, uh, the cognitive outcome also improved significantly after the, the intervention. And I can tell you one story. One of our neurosurgeons saw me after uh, probably a year of the intervention, and he told me, 
either your phones are broken or this thing is working because we, you guys have ne- haven't called me for a while for a post-emergent clinical dilatation intervention. It does it does work and it does have a long-term uh, neurodevelopmental outcome impact as well. And then uh, you're talking about a low uh, endometacine and, and the other question was what? Platelets. Platelets. Role of I platelets and IVH and PDA. And less the baby's thrombocytopenic. And there, there was that uh, recent study that showed that it might cause harm, especially with the inflammatory reaction that um, can, can cause from the uh, platelet transfusion. And we didn't find correlation between the platelets number and the IVH itself. So unless whatever threshold you come, uh, you, you have in your center, I'll go with it, whether it's 50,000 or 30,000 or 20,000, uh, I'll follow the guideline, but we didn't find a correlation. And, and with Dr. Rani Bashir also, we looked at the thrombocytopenia and uh, intracranial hemorrhage in HIE and infants, and we didn't find correlation between the numbers and uh, the incidence and the degree of uh, intracranial hemorrhage in HIE. So I would say I wouldn't give platelets until it's uh, below threshold that you would treat usually in your center. Endometacine, we went through phases. We were giving everybody endometacine below 28 weeks gestational age. And we found that many of those kids had spontaneous bowel perforation. And then we moved completely away from giving endometacine and we started to uh, give ibuprofen or uh, paracetamol or not treating PDA and we found problem with that. Uh, and the, the reason for that PDA is such a complex, it's just a bridge. You can, you can, you can uh, get through with medical aid or smuggle drugs. So it's, it's a bystander bridge and, and what the context where that bridge is makes it uh, one way or another. Sometimes you need to keep it open if the baby has significant PPHN to offload the right ventricles. And if you give those babies intermedicine to prematurely close that PDA, you might put extra strain on the right ventricles and the baby might develop uh, the oxygen requirement. And then you go into, into giving surfactant. When the baby doesn't need surfactant, then they go downhill and develop IVH. On the other hand, if you have a hemodynamically significant PDA and it's completely left to right, then you need to close that PDA whether it's targeted uh, endometacine with beautiful one dose and repeat the echo, or you give it earlier at the, within the first 12 hours to close that PDA and to prevent the uh, IVH. For us, what we have done, we looked at our cohort, we found that those babies below 26 weeks who received no antenatal steroids or partial antenatal steroids, they were at higher risk of uh, IVH and the outborn one. So we, we targeted those populations. So those outborn outside the tertiary center who received no antenatal steroid or partial antenatal steroid, uh, less than 26 weeks, they are eligible for uh, prophyla- prophylactic endometacine. For the ones who didn't receive prophylactic endometacine, what I do if they have uh, RTS, they receive surfactant, I do echo at around 24 hours of age. And when the PD is mostly left to right, there's still a tinge of right to left that protects the brain perfusion. I treat it with endometacin to close that PDA. Most of my colleagues, they don't because they are still afraid of the uh, higher right side pressure and PPHN, but I do and I accept a little bit of higher if I do. And uh, most of this baby, they do well and the PDA can close. So uh, a- apart from the uh, risk of the gut perforation, uh, endometacin, uh, you know, what about its role in you know ischemic brain injury? Uh, does it increase, decrease IVH, and at the same time increase the risk of ischemic brain injury in the long long run? So that was one of our balancing measure uh, to look at because we we were very conservative in treating the uh, blood pressure hypertension. And also we were giving endometacin. So we looked at the ischemic injury, whether the rate of uh, incidence of ischemic injury increased or not. And the incidence of uh, cystic PVL and porencephalic cysts did not increase after the intervention, which I must say the endometacin part, the compliance wasn't that great because we are different when it comes to our comfort level of giving endometacin. But the use of inotropes was decreased, and we were worried that we are accepting more hypotension and hypoperfusion, and the rate of ischemia will increase in, in our baby, which wasn't the case. 
Okay, the next question by Dr. Sharif As Afsar. Your seizure treatment protocol in very preterm ELBW infants. Of course, that's an entire, I think, talk by itself, probably. Yeah, I think, interestingly, most of preterm babies, they, their seizures are subclinical. And we, we probably have many of subclinical seizures that were undiagnosed because we don't monitor them. And there, there, there has been studies with some big centers that showed frightening data that many of these preterm babies, they have subclinical seizures. Whether treat them or not, the right answer, I don't know. What I found personally, if you have a preterm baby with grade four IVH, what we used to call grade four IVH, and uh, you need to monitor those babies if you can, because I found those babies, they can seize because the, the blood is in the parenchyma. And once the blood is in the parenchyma, it can irritate the surface and cause seizure that you can pick up on the EEG. And one of the interesting clinical indicators I found, if you have unexplained mild lactic acidosis that you cannot explain with your respiratory status. Those babies are usually in status epilepticus and that lactic is coming from the brain. If your CO2 is fine, it's in the 40s and 50s and the pH is fine, ventilation settings really minimal, but then you have this nagging mild lactic acidosis, five to six lactate that you cannot explain. The baby has brain injury then most likely that baby is seizing. The other scenario, clinical scenario, I would say, if you are giving aminophilin, in those baby, they have, most of the time, they have um, uh, myoclonic seizures. You have these jerky movements, and uh, you, you, you measure your aminophilin level, and you might find it outside the therapeutic clinic. Thank you. That, that was a very interesting observation about the lactate. So uh, uh, are there publications on this? Have you published this already? We are um, the um, unexplained lactate and seizure. Now, because I have noticed it in, in, in several cases now. I think we, we, once we have enough numbers. So. OK. Uh, a question by Dr. Rama Kaja. How uh, delayed uh, cord clamping in how much should you delay cord clamping in preemies with and without spontaneous breathing? I mean, again, I think that's a controversial area and work in progress, but what's your take on that? I think breathing is the key. You, 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 you rightly hit the nail on the head because the breathing creates that negative pressure that will suck the blood from the cord. And without that, you're pushing the, the blood away by your positive pressure medication. So what we recommend as a standard clinical care, as long as the baby is breathing, you are fine up to 60 seconds. At 60 seconds, we, we ask them to stop. But if the baby is not breathing, there are studies nowadays where the research comes with it, says resuscitation on the intact cord. And the, the data, the results, I am not aware that they are out there. We are one of the participating centers where we, we resuscitate on the intact cord. And the physiology that makes sense is that spontaneous negative pressure that creates the vacuum effect will take blood one way towards the baby, not the other way. Um, the next question, which is related to this, is about which gestation would you consider cord milking if a delayed cord can, clamping cannot be done? And uh, a second question by the same uh, individual is, what is the maximum CPAP you recommend for extreme premature infants? Well, cord milking, we don't do it anymore. And there was a, a recent RCT published where they had to stop the study because the incidence of mortality and brain injury increase in the cord milking uh, arm. And the, the answer is in your question. He you said, if you can't do a delayed cord clamping, and you ask, you need to ask yourself, why can't I do delayed cord clamping? Maybe the baby's not breathing, maybe it's not indicated, maybe resuscitation become priority. and. Milking the cord in those situations, I would say, may potentially be harmful. Because you have a sick baby who is not breathing, and then suddenly you are pushing this blood inside the baby in, in very fast way. And that might increase the uh, change the hemodynamics abruptly. Uh, we stopped doing it in, in our center just because we were worried about the uh, fluctuation and abrupt hemodynamic change. Uh, and the next question was. What is the maximum CPAP that you give at your center of extremely preterm infants? We, we, we don't have number. It depends how we, we used to have a CPAP phobia and we, we, 
the goal maximum of six, but now we can give it up to 12 seconds. Uh, and they, it's what they need uh, to maintain the, the, the mean area of pressure that will, will keep them uh, well saturated and avoid mechanical ventilation without being delayed. Sometimes we, we have self pride. We, we extubated the baby within 24 hours and the baby is just crying for the tube back. And we say, no, no, the baby's fine. We can ask you the one ventilation. And then by the time we put the tube down in, it's too late. The brain auto regulation is gone. We should have intubated this baby earlier. The, the, the thing we have learned from this is you know, we have to have a protocol and we have to all follow the protocol because without that, there's no way we can come back and study our practice, whether you extubate within the first 72 hours or not. What's our criteria for extubation? And more, more important than that is what our criteria for reintubation because we don't want to keep these babies longer than needed before putting the tube back in. So uh, if I understood uh, you are okay even with CPAPs going up to about 12. Yeah, yeah. And, we, uh, we do we do CPAP to maintain the mean the mean airway pressure, desired mean airway pressure. We go high. Mm -hmm. but then, and of course we'll monitor closely all the vital signs and chest and Yeah. Uh, of the next question is uh, of all the interventions that were there in your care bundle in your QI study, which do you think was the most useful? Do you want me to name one or few? <laughs> Maybe uh, the top three seated, you know, the yeah, I think three seated minimal players. Handling, minimal handling, I would say, was one because it, it can serve as a magnet for, for several interventions. We, we suddenly left the babies alone. Uh, our use of sedation has decreased. Our uh, intervention numbers has decreased as well. So it, it brought up many interventions to it. And the second, I would say our protocolization of hemodynamic management, which decreased significantly, I was used finally. And I must say, I'm talking about the physiologic hypotension in this case. I'm not talking about septic shock hypotension. I'm not talking about PDA related hypertension because those kind of hypertension requires it. I'm talking about that physiologic nadir blood pressure that most of us use to treat based on numbers and the babies would be completely fine. The third intervention will be the delayed core family. So those are the three I would name that made the, the most uh, impact. Okay. For some re reason, my video has gone off, but I'll just continue. The next question is by Dr. Kishore Sanghvi. He asked that, is it possible that invasive BP monitoring leads to excessive or increased use of inotropes and um, boluses, and that in turn causes increase in IVH because you're more prone to chasing numbers and not looking at the neonate if you have invasive BP monitoring? Do you think that's a possibility? It's possible. It's possible. And same goes with the, the echocardiography that we used to do many of echocardiography. It's, it's really what you do with what you have. And the, what, what, I, what I found beneficial is the combination of clinical markers and tools, uh, either echo or the, the BP measurement. If you have a safeguard of clinical uh, the, the markers, then you don't overtreat. Well, what we have done with our hemodynamic management, we said, if your mean BP is below the third centile, not below gestational age as we used to. We have these tables for the third center, and you have one of the clinical markers. And those clinical markers, we say the capillary refill time longer than three seconds, or the lactate is increasing, or the urine output is um, more less than one mL uh, per kg per hour. Then you look at for the reason why this baby is hypertensive. Is it PDA? You do your echo. That's where your interventions and, and the diagnostic imaging become important. Because if you don't do that, let's say a baby is clinically um, um, the hemodynamically unstable and you decided to treat. If you don't have uh, invasive BP measurement, if you don't have echocardiography, then you are shooting in the dark. And we have seen this kind of management where we give inotropes to babies and we escalate to dopamine, dobutamine, epinephrine, and then the blood pressure is still tanking down. You put the probe on and you look at the heart and the heart is like a, going fast like a hamster. There's no time for filling, the tank is empty. When, only when we did the echo, 
we knew that we need to back off to decrease our inotropes to allow for filling. And then sure enough, the blood pressure improved and, and uh, we, we, we were able to decrease the inotropes. So yes, it should be a tool in your package, a combination of clinical and diagnostic imaging markers. That, that, that would be a reasonable approach, I would say. But it's yeah, true. I, I, I think that's that's been a very very important message from your talk today. You know the the rationalizing the use of boluses and inotropes because I think they they, they are grossly overused in the first few hours of life. Uh, the next question is: uh, At what pH in extremely preterm infants would you like to act when there is a metabolic uh, acidosis? Is there some pH below which you will actually do something about the pH? Yeah, in the bundle we said 7.20. That's where we 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 we, we put our cutoff. Like there's no magic in that, but to create consistency, we, we put the 7.20 as a number. Below that, we need to do something about it. Above 7.20, we'll next. Okay. Uh, the the next few questions are uh, you've probably already answered. One of them is will AI you know can address these issues? I think you've touched upon that. And in preterm babies, how long do you do delayed cord clamping? I think you've already touched upon that. Uh, what is the next question is by Dr. Mubashir Hassan Shah? What is the policy of using antenatal magnesium sulfate in your unit? We do we do use magnesium sulfate and those uh, threatened preterm labors when they come and uh, you think that the um, mom would deliver. Now uh, the, they might not decrease your IVH rate, but it will improve the neurodevelopmental outcome. Yes. Okay. The next question by Dr. Amita Call is, uh, and she reflects a problem that is seen in many uh, centers in India that we have a high incidence of chorioamnionitis, that's what she says, and ELBW. And if they have low blood pressure with metabolic acidosis uh, and they need, and you think they need anatrophs, how do you suggest we manage? I would suggest in that case to, if you have the ability to put do point of care ultrasound, do point of care ultrasound to guide your management. Look at the contractility and fill. If you are dealing with septic shock, uh, you are dealing with vasodilator shocks, but then we have agents like dopamine, norepinephrine become important in these cases. But if you have the ability to do point of care ultrasound, I'll be okay. Okay, uh, thank you. The next question is by Dr. Aditi De. Uh, she asks uh, that is there a role of amplitude integrated EEG? in changing the management of uh, preterm neonates in the first 72 hours to reduce the risk of IVH? I should think... you should you put everybody on AEG and is there some way it help, would help to reduce the risk of IVH, is there? I think that's a very rich area for research and the future will be for more monitoring. It's just not feasible right now. Because of the, the number of preterm babies we have, for example, in our center only, we get about 130 preterm babies below 28 weeks gestation age. And I imagine we, you will have way higher numbers in, in India. Putting this babies on EEG, putting a tool is one thing, and being able to manage it is another thing. Because you will need to train your nurses to put the EEG on. You need to develop a system so somebody can read it. Uh, continuously, you have to upload it into server, and you have to have the expertise who are able to read it. I think that will come in the future, but at, at this time, uh, it's not feasible for clinical care to use it universally in all preterm babies. But many questions can be answered to amplitude integrated EEG using research. Right, so that's still an open area. Uh, the next question by Dr. Kumar Gaurav the timing of starting inotropes in extreme preemies considering their pressure passive uh, circulation? Well, we try to avoid it in the first 72 hours. In a way, after 72 hours, you are at the risk of IVH is much, much less. Although using it after 72 hours is associated with, with higher risk of white matter injury. But the timing is where, when you think this hemodynamic uh, instability starting to impact the baby. And it goes back to the combination of clinical and uh, physiologic markers that you develop in your center. 
Uh, we finished with the questions in the QA uh, box, and I would now hand over to my co-chairperson, Dr. Senthil Kumar, yeah. to take on the questions which are in the chat box. And uh, those are interspersed. You know, there are some general comments, and then there are questions. So, Senthil, you'll you have a, a task yeah. on your hands. Yeah, <laughs> yes, over sir. to you, Dr. Senthil. Yeah. Uh, uh, actually, it's a very uh, excellent talk uh, by Harshit. Uh, the way in which you put your things to make it happen is an uh, excellent art. And uh, you are done in QI in an excellent manner. Uh, and the one which is which is very interesting is that at minimum handling, you put it in the number one uh, in uh, the main intervention. That's uh, that's very fantastic. And uh, the, within 72 hours, actually uh, uh, avoiding and uh, boluses and uh, anotropes, which is very, very, very useful things. And which, which is going to have a, much more neuroprotective effect in uh, many babies. And uh, one, one question I have been there is that uh, from Dr. Paul, uh, is there any role of uh, phenobarbitone to prevent IVH? Is there questions? I, I, yeah, I can recall there was a very old study when they used uh, phenobarb and uh, muscle relaxant. And then indeed it did decrease IVH because it would decrease variability and uh, hemodynamic changes and vital sign changes. The problem with that is we know that phenobarbital cause apoptosis and giving phenobarbital prophylactically in a vast uh, universally to all preterm baby can cause harm more than benefit to prevent that small number of IVH. And same goes to um, muscle relaxing. So that's why it, it hasn't been used universally to prevent IVH, but the idea behind it is, is uh, legit and important because it, it, it slows, it sedates the baby in a way and it slows the, the changes in the brain perfusion. Another question is, uh, so what is the neurodevelopment outcome of on babies with an IVH? Oh, that's depend on the degree of uh, IVH. When the Canadian United Network looked at the risk factors for long-term outcome, the, the, the most impactful one was preterm brain injury using ultrasound. So it, it is independent risk factor for adverse neurodevelopmental outcome. The worse your IVH degree, the, the higher risk of adverse outcome, However, it, 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 you have to put it in the context. For example, the case I presented had classic grade four IVH with points paralysis, and she had fantastic outcome. Even she doesn't even have CP. So it depends where is the location, how big it is, and what's the complication. In this fortunate case, there was only points paralysis. There was no ventricular megaly. And the, the cyst that was left behind was very small. So the brain was able to rewire itself and bypass the injury. And we know that the baby's brain and preterm brain, they are very elastic and resilient. They can bypass injury. So I, I, I stopped hold, carrying those outcome cards. I used to carry them and uh, tell the parent the numbers or the risk of 23, your baby's 23 weeks. So the risk of CP is there, the risk of blindness, this and this, this whatnot. But I, I noticed that this is defeating the purpose because then I went into this label locked minds and the parents were fixating on the CP and sure enough what they were afraid of happens because they didn't invest in their kids enough because they were afraid of this outcome. And realizing that each case is different, each degree is different and each injury is different, each environment is different, parents, kids, their life, we have our own stories, each one of us. So it was, for me, it didn't make sense to lump them all together in numbers. So I, I even when the parents ask me about the number, I don't give them the number and say, you, you, you the story of your kid is different and you, you can write it and you can write the end. Okay, thanks. Okay, well, the rest of the questions have been uh, already discussed in a uh, question and answer box. And, um, it's an excellent uh, evening for all of us to enjoy this. Uh, I, ha I have one final question, Dr. Korshid Mohammed. So by when realistically do you think you'll be able to drive IVH to zero? Uh, well, 
I think we can. I, I remember what I have. I was talking with one uh, the visiting professor about HIE and how we will improve on the identification. And he just looked at me and he said, it doesn't make sense to me that HIE still exists. I think human being will become smart enough at some point to prevent asphyxia. And I think at, at, at some point, I'm hoping that we, we will be able to prevent IVH and, and drive it to zero. Um, I, I, I can't tell you when, but I, I think we can. Thank you very much. It was a wonderful presentation. I, and uh, on behalf of my co-chairperson, we hand, over, hand it over back to Dr. Manoj and the organizers. Thank you, sir. Uh, we all agree we had a wonderful session today. Uh, let me express uh, our sincere gratitude to all of you. Professor Khurshid, Mohammed, uh, as usual, I heard a uh, lot many lectures of yours. In, and as usual, uh, lectures are really I mean, uh, stimulating it makes you more. You makes it more. Makes you motivated to do more and more. And then adding a QA initiative to all the topics is something that really I admire you for. So uh, I have great pleasure in inviting you for our uh, the, the grand finale in this series, which is a national conference of the Indian Academy of Pediatrics Neonatology chapter. We are scheduled. Tentatively in March, uh, and, and, and I am just saying within uh, uh, some, uh, I don't know what uh, phrases, uh, tentatively uh, in March in the, from 10 to 13. Uh, so uh, we uh, extend a hearty invitation to you. Of course, we will be inviting you subsequently. This is, uh, uh, thank you so much for finding time to be with us today. Thank you, Professor Koshit. Thank you so I, much. It has been an honor, and I have so many close friends and teachers from India. It's always fun and honor to present and visit. Thank you.